let's worship together. Come on. Stand and sing with us.
good to be in this place tonight. Am I right? Woo! All right, y'all. We are so excited to be here with y'all. We are so excited to worship with y'all. And before we go into this next song, I'm just going to pray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to settle myself down a little bit. And uh, <laughs> y'all, man, I God, God is so out. good, isn't he? <laughs> I worship so hard, I yanked my cord out. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right, but let's pray. <laughs> God, we come before you today just so incredibly thankful and so grateful, God, that you are turning our graves into gardens. Lord, you are you are using our stories for your glory. And I'm so, so thankful. God, we are so thankful to be in this place, to worship you with all of our being, God. We're giving this breath that you've given us back to you, Lord, and I pray that you would just accept this fragrant offering, Lord. God, we give it all to you. We love you so, so much. It is in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Here I am down on my
You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Come on. I'm no longer a slave. To fear. Oh, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Your love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. And I'm no
dag on. There's just, here, let's trade. Can we trade? There's just something about worshiping with you guys, man. This is fire, dude. This, this is what the body of Christ looks like. Amen. They turned it off on me. They didn't want me to speak. Is your, you better check yours. What you got going on? Oh, come Somebody's on. Calling Phil. Me. Can you believe this? Somebody's calling me. Come on. It's like we've done this. Hang come on. on. We've done this Hang before. On. Hello. Phil. Okay. Well, while we're waiting for Phil, let's start with the five small group guidelines. I've got to do the guidelines. I'll go. Now his microphone's on. Hang they on. sabotaged us. You later, okay? Phil, you're supposed to take number one. Well, I've got to take number one. Bye. Not do number one, Phil. Number one. Ugh. You're killing me, man. Talk about everything except for your own what thoughts you and feelings. No. And no. take all the time you want. This terrible you advice. You got all night. Now, if you talk to Phil, you know that that's true because Phil can speak forever. We know that this is not what we do here at Celebrate Recovery. We keep our sharing focused on our own thoughts and feelings. We talk about ourselves not other people being our problems that we need to work on our own recovery. And we're sharing just three to five minutes because we get in into a sharing with Chatty Cathy's. We're going to be here forever. So we limit our sharing three to five minutes to keep our group safe. What about number two? Number two, talk, cross talk all you want. Talk to everybody while somebody else is talking. Don't think a thing about it. Ain't nobody going to It's another notice. terrible idea, Phil. You usually give really good advice. This is what, you're off tonight, man. What's wrong? You all right? Oh, My number two, there's no color. crosstalk. Crosstalk is with two. Somebody bashed the angry Italian. Did I just hear that? He ate the, he ate the angry Italian because I'm feeling okay. So that's what I'm saying. Hate the angry that's Italian. The best thing I've no crosstalk tonight. means there's two individuals, individuals engaged in conversation, excluding other people. What Field has had a minute to go when he got a phone call would be a part of crosstalk. When we go into share groups, we mute our phones so we'll make sure that we can. Free to express our feelings without being interrupted. What about number three? He does, he does this to me all the time. Number three. So I am here to fix y'all. <laughs> Tell me your troubles and I'll take care of you. Now, if Bob, if Bob Evans was here, he would stand up here and say, be like, no, 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 no. That's not what Phil does. And he knows that's not what we do here too. That's not what we do here. We're here to be able to support He's one another, me. but we're not going to try to fix you. He's a contractor at heart. He can fix the majority of his stuff outside of here, but when he comes inside here, he's here to encourage you, support you, and try to encourage you to do better inside of your recovery. But number four. Number four, anonymity and confidentiality. <laughs> Let's hear what you have to say about this. Let's see. It's going to be a tough one. If somebody tells you a good, juicy one tonight, <laughs> come tell me. I want to hear it, okay? Thanks. Good, juicy and one. tell the world. Put it on Facebook. <laughs> All right, we do not do that here at Celebrate Recovery. Anonymity no, and confidentiality. No, no. That is the basic requirements of this ministry. If I go in and share about me struggling, eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and it's true, it could be, and it gets out in public, I'm going to be having a bad well, issue. It's more with peanut butter and jelly from what I can tell. I love peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> so what is shared in the group stays in the group. It does not go out. Me and Phil will not talk about what we hear inside share group. None of the, neither will any of our ladies. So you are safe when you go inside of our share groups. What about number five? Number five says don't be doing no cussing in group, okay? <laughs> pastor's here. You better be careful. Your pastor's here. That's right. Be... Steve's here, so we can't cuss tonight. <laughs> you you got to clean up your language tonight, don't you? Well, shoot. Shoot. <laughs> Offensive language is not just the four and five letter words that we grew up saying, maybe underneath our breath, maybe wide open. This is also trigger words. Somebody, I'm a, my name's Johnny. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. I'm in recovery for a porn addiction. If it goes into trigger language, we just ask that you raise up your hands. We just want this ministry to be safe so that you could come in here and leave a little bit better off than you were when you got here. So this is, these five guidelines are the five share group guidelines that keeps our ministry safe. In doing so, the majority of you have never experienced a share group session. Next week, we will continue doing Celebrate Recovery with our teaching and lesson testimony. Next week's lesson is on relapse. I would encourage you guys to come back. Be a part of what we're doing here during large group and down here in share group. But when you come to share group, when you come to CR, we will never tag you. We will never share anything that is going on inside of your lives. 
Your recovery is your recovery. You work it at your own speed. Got anything you want to add to that? I think any I'm more wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> you have plenty of wisdom, man. You got I any more? Don't I, though, now? These guidelines are what make this place work. Yep. These guidelines are what give us the freedom to work our recovery and gain freedom through Jesus Christ. That's right. Thank you, guys. Exactly right. All right. Don't leave yet. We got to do these Oh, I got to do that, too? You just going to try to pile it all on me, ain't you? All right. Remember, we are a cross in recovery ministry. Uh, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we will not push him on you, but he is our cornerstone. He is the one that we are building our life on. If you are, if you are atheist, Satanist, and, and I don't know the other one, atheist, whatever it may be. If, if you're, you're here, from Mendota, agnostic, even. if you are still here to work your recovery, you're welcome. We're glad to have you here. We just want you to feel welcome. We want you to know that we care for you, that we love you, and that we will encourage you just like we would encourage anyone else inside of this building. You want to take number two? Which one is number that two? Would, that what is said here. What's said here. That's anonymity. What's said here. How'd you butcher that a minute who's ago? Who's seen here. It stays here. It stays here. Here, here. Here, here. We keep it here. That's part of the anonymity thing. Yep. Doesn't go out of this room. That's why we're safe. Exactly right. Number three is a first-time guest is CR 101. Next time when you come back, you will be a part of Celebrate Recovery 101. You'll come back inside here after our large group session. Not tonight. Not tonight. Next we have week no when share groups back. tonight. When we're having speakers here, we're going to have a question and answer session, so it could go a little bit longer. But tonight, we will not have share group. Next week, come back. You can go through the 101 process, and you can see why we do what we do here at Celebrate Recovery. Please don't take your food or your drink to the lower building when you go to share group. Next but week. Next week. It. But see, that means you got to come back next, next week so I can tell you again. Yep, that's exactly right. And then we are inside of a church. We want to, like, if you have any prayer requests, please let us know. You can write it on your card, get it to us, drop it in a basket on your way out. If there's any way we can serve you guys, please don't hesitate to let us know. We really do care for you. Our staff will pray over your prayer requests. Anonymity, confidentiality are really important here. So if you don't want to put your name on it, do not feel stressed. But we will pray for you. If you have any prayer requests, please do. Don't hesitate to let us know. Is that it on this? Think so. Think so. Bye I think we got a video. I'm telling you, you guys don't know what you're in for. That gone. This is going to be good. It's going to be real good. If this good. don't catch you on far, you would ain't wet. Far. When I, a little girl, couldn't get those images out of my head, I'm thankful for 50 shades of grace. For every time I found my way to the websites I shouldn't have seen. When I idolized the allure and the power of the women on the screen. For every time I thought becoming like them would make me sexy and accepted by the men I would meet. For every time I rationalized that I was watching it so I could learn a few things. For every time the guilt and the shame afterwards lingered in me, I am thankful for 50 shades of grace. To everybody, I was living the dream. I mean, I, I looked so good and, and um, you know, I was winning pageants and I was making the next level in the Olympic program and, and I was doing all of these things and everyone had a big old pat on the back for me and no one saw that inside I was broken, shattered. When I convinced myself I was still holy because I'd never given anyone everything, I filled my heart with boys. I filled my heart with any form of affection I could get that would numb that pain for just the slightest bit of time. And when the frustrated voices in my head wanted to scream at the strangers in my bed, but I put on a smile to seem sexy. And I remember praying to the Lord and, and saying, you know what? I, I want to trust you, but I don't. For the still small voice inside of me that never stopped repeating, you're worth more than all of these things. And for the king who met me in my filth and wreckage and told me I was redeemed, I'm thankful for 50 shades of grace. God is beautiful. God is beautiful. 
God is beautiful. For the new heart I was given to ache deeply for the sexual sin in our society. For the new creation God made me undefined by my broken things. Five, three through five calls us to rejoice in our adversity because adversity produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope. And hope in the Holy Spirit never fails us. And for the forgiveness he extended when I struggled to forgive myself, I'm thankful for 50 shades of grace. For the man who came along, and met me in my heel. I'm thankful for 50 shades of grace when he found beauty in my scars and courage in my voice. And when we crawled into a bed as husband and wife, blanketed only in holy matrimony, I owed everything to the 50 shades of grace that were so undeserved, but so freely given to me. My name is Mo Isom, and this was the truth. Now I dare you to live it. Celebrate recovery, get off your meat, get on your feet, and welcome Mo Isom to the stage. Thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've never heard that, get off your meat and onto your feet. I'm going to use that with my children. That's fantastic. Um, <laughs> You guys, I am so, so incredibly honored to be here and so incredibly excited and expectant for what the Lord is going to do. Um, I don't know about y'all. I just about lost it in worship. Was anyone else able to hold it together? Because that was beautiful and powerful. And I feel the presence of the Spirit of the living God. And where the anointing is present, His anointing has the power to break the yoke. He didn't just come that we would be Christians who limp through life and somehow learn how to cope. He came to set the captives free. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the Word of God says that as He has made us free, so we would work to remain free. This is a beautiful life and a beautiful process of encountering God and then walking with him day in and day out as he transforms us into who we were truly made to be. I want to pray before we start because the word of God says that, that the kingdom of God is not in talk but in power. And so I could talk a lot and share a lot of words, but if the power of the Spirit of God is not welcomed to move in whatever way he sees fit, then we will have spent a nice time together just listening to a lady talk. But if the Spirit of the Lord is here, I, I believe he will move in a way that takes my story, because I'm going to testify. The Word of God says that sin is defeated by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies, that the power of life and death lies in our tongue. So to speak, it already puts our heels on the neck of the enemy, right? It already backs him into a corner to find the courage and to find the freedom to speak the truth and to testify. It carries power because the, the blood of the Lamb has been slain. It's been spread. His work is finished. He said it is finished. What he needed to carry out was complete. And when we encounter that, he says, now go and tell. Testify. Not that we would word vomit all of our baggage, but that we would share our weaknesses so we could point to the glory of the cross. The only one who has the power to transform our lives, to set us free, to use us in powerful ways for our good and for his glory. So I want to invite a move of the Spirit that will take my words and prophetically translate them to each and every one of you. Because our stories are likely different in different ways. But his wonder-working power in and through all things resonates. And when we testify, there's a resonance that reminds us we're a unified body and reminds us of the goodness and the glory of the one who set us free. I don't know if they prepared you. I fully prepared to minister a word today, so we can just buckle our pants up. I will share a story, but I don't like to hold back. Um, I couldn't stand growing up this Christianity, this Christianese that was like so frilly 
and um, safe and uh, unapplicable to what I was really navigating. <laughs> and when I encountered Jesus, not only did he break past what was safe and taboo, he, he actually reached in and touched the hardest, most broken, most shameful parts of my story and delivered me. And so the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who we worship, the one who carries the power to do just this, is not concerned with our etiquette and our frills and our fluff so much as he is concerned with whatever it takes to set his people free. And so I don't really, um, I'm not always eloquent, so <laughs> I want to pray that the Spirit of God would do what he intends to do. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. We exalt your name. You are Abba. You are our perfect Father. You are the name above all names. You are Alpha and Omega. You were, you are, and you always will be. You are sovereign. You are holy. You are seated above. Oh, who is it? What is it of you that you would pay mind to us? Surely it is your love, Father that makes you both the creator of the heavens and the earth and the one who knows every single hair on our head. Thank you for your majesty and your intimacy. Thank you, God, for who you are. We pray today that you would be exalted above all things, that your name would be glorified. Heavenly Father, I pray the blood of Jesus over this gathering space. I pray the blood of Jesus over each and every person gathered here, Lord, that you would sanctify this space, that you would bind up whatever would seek to steal, kill, or destroy the message of your glorious gospel. I cancel the assignment of any familiar spirits, Lord, that would seek to confuse or trigger anyone gathered here, God. We testify and we call them out. We shine light into the darkness, not that we would be dragged further in, God, but that the light would dispel the darkness and that we would see freedom come. So we just pray that you would move in a pure and holy way, that you would renew our minds in this moment, that you would fasten on the helmet of salvation, God, that you would be glorified through testimony, God that you would move in every way you see fit and that we would encounter you like never before. We worship you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I didn't know they were going to do that story that kind of spliced together a little bit of a testimony video that I had done as well as a spoken word that I had uh, written. I, um, that was neat to see, and it, it draws me back sometimes <clears throat> To, to like a decade ago, about 10 years ago, and the things I would have stepped up and led with in meeting someone or in introducing myself. Uh, it's the highs that the world exalts and celebrates, right? We fake it till we make it. We want to wear our masks. We want to act like we have it all together. We lust and idolize after the successes of people, and yet somehow that postures them in a place that feels um, separate and like almost creates a covetedness in our heart, right? Or the thoughts that that could never be us, that's not our backstory, that's not uh, the opportunities that we were granted in life or the privileges or the home life, that that person has something they received that was of greater blessing. And, and what's crazy and kind of scary about the fact that our culture moves and speaks and shares in that way is that it is not reality. It's not reality. Ten years ago, I would have led in introducing myself with the fact that I was an All-American goalkeeper for the LSU women's soccer team, that I had training with and trying out for the men's football team as a place kicker, that I was homecoming queen, that I was doing all of these amazing things, and that would have caused others likely to think I was set apart in some special way, but they didn't see or know the reality of what was really going on underneath the surface. And the reality is that we are far more linked in commonality, in communion, in unity, in our weaknesses than we are in our strengths. 
There is an adversary who is after every single one of our souls and every single one of our identities. We all share that in common. And there was a Savior who died for every single one of our souls and every single one of our identities to be redeemed. And so we share that in common. And in a culture that wants to set itself apart by uncommon successes, I think the gospel looks like coming together in vulnerability, in intimacy, in relationship, and sharing the reality of our humanity as it collides with with his divinity and as it collides with assault from the enemy and what we have endured. This is why testimony carries power. I was raised up in the church <clears throat> uh, with wonderful God-fearing parents who worked really hard to instill in me what it meant to be a godly woman. It's like upper middle class, suburbs of Georgia, Bible Belt. It was common to be a Christian. So my faith was very much kind of this faith by inheritance, right? This faith on a leash of my parents. They're Christians, so I'm a Christian. They're in church on Sunday, so I'm in church on Sunday. And we worked really hard to be good people, right, and um, showed up and got the attendance. I even called them Jesus points. This is how skewed it was in my mind. I was like, you go each week and get like your Jesus points, and thank goodness if there's a wedding or a funeral, because then you can sleep in on Sunday because you showed up and there was a word ministered there, and so you got the Jesus point. It was a very strange thought that I had, but it was a cultural Christianity. A lot of people out here claim to be Christians. And their lives don't testify to Christ. And that was very much me. Because I thought, because I was in those spaces, or I professed to be a Christian, then that was good, right? That way I was saved, right? And I didn't have the connection points that brought the reality of what it means when we profess Christ as Lord and our need for him and our revelation of him and our true identity. So as I started to navigate the reality of a young teen's life, uh, there were a number of things that I wanted to control, how successful I would be athletically, socially, where I would fit in, uh, relationally, how things would play out in my home, in that dynamic. Um, I was doing some modeling and some radio work, some acting at the time. I wanted to determine how successful all these things would be. I was transitioning into high, high school and really the proclamation of my heart. And again, I want you all to hear me as all of us navigate these layers and steps in our life where the proclamation of my heart was really, God, watch me work. Watch what I will do. Watch what I can make of myself. Hear my really loud proclamations of how I won't be like this person or how I will achieve this. Listen to my will be done here in Mo's life as it should be. That was kind of my mindset. And I'll still claim to be a Christian, and I'll still show up at church and get the Jesus points, but really my life was just about me in my worldview. And then I moved into high school and began living things out, and nothing really went the way I hoped it would. I desired so much for control, and yet I realized I didn't really have control over anything. There were girls bigger, faster, stronger, who advanced on the teams sooner than I did. Uh, relationally, things were tense at home. Um, socially, I walked into school six feet tall as a freshman in high school, sticking out like a sore thumb. The bullying was pretty intense. And the ways that God had set me apart and designed me became the very thing that the world used to tear me down. Interesting how that will work in your life. But I wanted to control so many things and realized I didn't have control over anything. And because I knew a lot about God, but I did not know God, there is a difference. Then my foundation was pretty sandy versus being on a solid rock. I didn't know my identity. I didn't know who I was or whose I was. I thought my performance is what would warrant me acceptance. And so when it wasn't able to control how that looked, it sent me spiraling, right? When we don't know our true identity, we seek to, to find our identity in many things. At that time in my life, I had also been exposed around nine years old to uh, my dad's stash of pornography out of the blue. 
opened his truck door one day and this wad of, he always like shoved crud behind the seats and this stuff fell out and one of them was this playing card, this like poker card and I bent down a nine-year-old girl to pick it up and shove it back in there and I turned it over and it was a novelty poker card that had porn on one side and I don't know if you all can testify to maybe how this has infiltrated your life but there is something about that first moment of exposure to something deeply perverse that sears something on us. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I knew this wasn't my daddy, and it certainly wasn't my mommy, and why did I feel this way? And I tried to shove it back in and sit in the driver's seat and pretend I hadn't seen what I had seen when my hero climbed into the front seat. The one who I sought affirmation from, the one who I sought my worth from, right? And that overwhelming feeling because I didn't talk about it, because I didn't ask anyone about it, that shame kind of turned into curiosity. Remember, the power of life and death lies in the tongue. When we keep shame in silence, it festers. And it was almost like a siren on the cliffs is the best way I can kind of describe it. Pornography and my exposure to those things. It's like it was calling for me but it leads us to our death, right? And so I started seeking these things out. At the same time, a neighbor, an older neighbor, had taken me down in this fort by our creek and just unloaded everything she knew about sex and sexuality. She came from a very broken home, and frankly, I didn't ask. I was only nine, but I got the whole download from the teenager on the street, and it was in this time that I made this proclamation to my mom when I, um, I had to do a science experiment uh, or like a presentation on a trifold board, if we remember those. And I had to do a whole presentation on snakes, and this was like pre just being able to Google anything, and I had no idea how snakes had sex. It made no sense, the logistics. I had to go down and ask my mom because I had to present this to my class, the reproductive cycle. She was overwhelmed by the language I was using and the things I was asking. And in her nervousness of what she was realizing her little nine-year-old had already been exposed to, she simply said, no, 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 we're supposed to be uh, virgins when we get married. And I was a virgin and your father was a virgin. And God wants us to be virgins when we get married. And so I made this bold proclamation at nine years old that I would be a virgin when I got married. And I made this vain virginity vow and stomped out of the room, because I've always been theatrical, but I stomped out of the room so sure that that was it. And I didn't allow the conversation to continue that revealed the heart of purity that the Lord calls of us in thought and action in words and deed. I had a works-based answer for a life surrender question. And I made my vain vow and I marched forward and began to navigate life. And then in that tense time in high school, really my question started to become, okay, like I know I made this vow, but uh, how far is too far? And like, what counts? And um, how far can I push this envelope? And I'm addicted to pornography already at this part, at this point, doing these things in private. And I'm struggling with my identity. And these things are kind of colliding and confusing me. And so when my control issues collided with the perverse things that I was doing in the darkness, all of this kept in this isolated space welled up in me this control issue, these lies of the enemy, that something needed to be my identity, that I didn't look anything like those women. I was the huge girl. That was the picture of beauty and power. I stuck out like a sore thumb, but if I knew something of that, then maybe I would have some influence, and it manifested for me in a vicious eating disorder. Because the enemy will succeed if he can convince us to tear down our own temple. Eating disorder turned to self-harm. All these things still kept in the darkness. Like the video said, I'm succeeding on the surface, but I'm starting to abuse energy pills, diet pills, to have some sustenance because I'm not eating. I'm becoming control obsessed, logging things in journals, or working out six, seven, eight hours a day. I was just consumed. And I remember before I went off to college, I came across 
a piece of scripture. I couldn't have told you the context, the book. I didn't know any of this stuff at the time. Remember, I'm just Christian by culture. I didn't actually read my Bible. And I came across this scripture that said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And this is how much God loves us. He'll encounter us before we even know we need encountering. He finds us. He's present for us. He came down to us. He takes the initiative in rescuing us so many times. And I opened up to my mom about what was going on, and she got me help and with a counselor and a nutritionist. But ultimately, what she instilled in me is that if I wanted healing, I had to seek the healer, Jehovah Rapha, the great physician. That it wasn't going to be a faith by inheritance anymore. I was set to go to LSU eight hours away. I graduated high school early. I was headed to the Bayou of Temptation. Nothing good happens there. I'll be real, except we win national championships. But otherwise, not a lot good happens there. But she instilled in me that if I truly wanted healing, I had to seek the healer for myself. I didn't fully know what that meant. But I went off to school and I began to seek him. The enemy tried to convince me that I had to have it all figured out. Had to know all the answers, know all the scriptures, know how to share the gospel and make someone fall prostrate and accept Jesus on the spot. That I was only good to be used if I could perform perfectly. How much does that tie to our perfectionism and performance mindset? I told you I had wrestled with already. But God was gracious to meet me too in that time and said, No, I just want you to look for me, to seek me and you will find me, to give me the glory. So I began to operate in that way. Had an amazing freshman year athletically. Uh, scored a 90-yard goal as a freshman. It was just wild. I was a goalkeeper off a free kick. If anybody's a soccer fan, it doesn't make sense. They came back and tried to refilm it. I was like, I tore my tibia borealis. I don't know. Nothing's working. I can't kick it. They're like, that's not a muscle group. And I'm like, but I just can't do what, that, what I did again. That doesn't happen. And... It was this really special year of seeking him and seeing him now looking back, beginning to build this platform. He made like Sports Center top 10 plays and All American this and All SEC that, and he's building this platform. And I'm not even understanding what's happening at the time or why, but I had this amazing stretch of time, right? And I thought that meant, oh, I give God the glory and he gives me the blessings. Oh, I look for him and then the good things rain down. And that must mean. Uh, be what it means to walk as a Christian. Still this incomplete perspective of God. And I went home for Christmas break uh, after my freshman year, and one night my dad didn't come home. And the hours passed and our angst rose and fell asleep that night, really confused on what to even pray. We'd found a love note written beneath the telephone in our home that just said, I do love you, and had his name signed. But otherwise, the phone lines were cut off, and everything was straight to voicemail, and we had no clue where he was. And I fell asleep that night, confused on what to even pray. And I woke up the next morning to my mom screaming, the sheet of paper just crackling in her hand from the computer. Get in the car, get in the car, grab your shoes, grab your things. We pile in the car, we start speeding around town, and I ironed out this sheet of paper that she finally shoved into the back when I asked what it was that, that she had known, what we were looking for, what we were doing. And I ironed it out and looked down, and it was a suicide letter from my dad. He'd emailed a few short paragraphs, and now we had to find him before he gave up. And I remember standing in his office when all the noise and commotion of police officers making calls and looking for things and were searching his office for any clues of where he may be when everything kind of went quiet and three officers stepped in the door and they, speaking to my mom, they said, ma'am, we found your husband. And I thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. Whatever it is, God, whatever's going on, I believe you will heal it. I've seen that you're good. I've experienced the blessing. And so whatever it is, and they cleared their throats, and they said, I'm sorry, let us clarify. Uh, we found your husband's remains. 
So it was January 3rd, 2009 that my dad put a gun to his heart and pulled the trigger. And it was January 3rd, 2009, I took off running as far and as fast as I could from God. I don't believe that you're good. I don't believe that you're real. I don't believe that you love me. I don't believe any of this stuff I've been told. I don't want to believe any of it because if you were a good God, how could you let such a disastrous thing happen? And yes, he had been the gateway to my struggles with pornography. And yes, there was always a rest wrestling match with trying to make my father proud and feeling like I was walking on eggshells at home and just wanting to earn his love. And yes, there were dysfunctional things, but at the end of the day, he was still my daddy. And now my daddy was on a morgue table with the tiniest bullet hole that had just taken down a Goliath of a man. And I couldn't process how this identity, the suicidal man's daughter, was now a part of my story. It was so out of the blue. It was so unexpected and it just sent me spiraling because, again, I didn't know the truth of my identity. And if we don't know whose we are, any life circumstance, the enemy will try to write a new identity over our story. Oh, you're the addict. Oh, you're the, you're the, the one who molested. Oh, you're the girl with the eating disorder. Oh, you're the suicidal woman's uh, son. Oh, you're the one who came out of that rough neighborhood. The enemy wants to write so many false identities over us because he's terrified at what the gates of hell will endure when the people of God arise and see their true identity, no matter what has come across their life and no matter what type of circumstances have impacted them. And so if he can keep us blind, he can eliminate an army of righteous kingdom warriors that are meant to see kingdom come carried out here on earth as it will be in heaven. Amen. So I began to struggle with depression, anxiety, promiscuity. Give me any sin-sized piece to fill this God-sized hole in my heart. I took off running, rejecting it all, overwhelmed. I mean, physically it would manifest illness, my skin peeling, hives, emotionally things would manifest, I, alcohol, partying. This is what's terrifying. It looked like the average college experience. Let that sink in because of what I was actually navigating underneath looked like what's just common college life, right? How many young people in our culture are overwhelmed by the grip of sin and we think it's just a phase they're going through? We need people to arise to their true identity so they can be intercessors for those who are still held captive, intercessors for those who are lost, the, the, the hands and the feet that reach out and welcome them into the way and the truth and the life that can testify to the glory of what God can do. And I was very overwhelmed, and I remember having suicidal ideations myself. Let me just get real in the spirit realm. This is how this stuff will work. When I looked at my dad's body on a morgue table, it was like a spirit of suicide came upon me. And from that point forward, I was certain I would die. I was certain I would die young. I was certain I was going to commit suicide. I didn't even want to. And I was certain somehow it would happen to me. Because if my father was capable of it, then I was capable of it. That's what these voices in my mind were constantly saying. So I'm at a breaking point, really, about a year later. So good at faking fine. We could win Academy Awards, right? Yes, mom's doing well. Sloan, she's healing. Oh, praise God. Glory to God. Yes, soccer is good. I accepted awards at this time with a smile on my face. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a hypocrite to the max. It's so exhausting to live a fake life. And many of us have a plurality of masks we'll wear any given day, right? The word of God says to live double-minded. We should expect to receive nothing. We're tossed like the waves of the sea. And I was fractured. I was so double-minded. At the point of feeling like, God, just end all of this. Because I can't, I can't handle this suffering. And I was headed home down the interstate one day alone, like 1.30 in the morning, had been stuck in traffic. And I'm zoned out just watching the lines tick by. I've got my hookup 
texts on lock for when I get back home to Georgia. I'm just being real. These are my BC before Christ days. It was a mess, a mess and a half. And I've got it all orchestrated. Again, I'm addicted to pornography. I'm hiding behind these identities. I'm resentful and angry and cursing things in my heart, wanting to die myself, completely overwhelmed. And headed down that interstate, the cry of my heart is really culminating to God. Just end all of this or else just reveal yourself to me. I don't know what I believe. But I've got no breath in my lungs anymore. And it's overwhelming. And the next thing I knew, my car was in the center median and I, my wheel is like cranking and jerking, and I'm like, Mo, snap out of it. What is going on? I tried to pull my Jeep back onto the interstate, shot straight across at like 75 miles an hour, hit an embankment, flipped several times, and landed upside down in a ravine at 1.30 in the morning, completely alone and very physically broken. I'd broken a vertebrae in my neck, damaged my ribs, lung, liver, jaw. And yet I was hanging upside down in this Jeep, by my seatbelt, choking on my own blood. And when I tell you the presence and the power of the spirit of the living God entered into that wreckage, I can't even put words into what I encountered and what overwhelmed me. I get goosebumps to this day every time I talk about it because the weight of the glory was like, crushing and in the same moment soul resuscitating like it was such majesty yet in the same moment I had never felt more alive and I was very much not at my height of health but I remember feeling overwhelmed by the presence and the power of God who encountered me in a moment and I had heard the gospel 10,000 times over growing up in one ear out the other in this moment I encountered the living God I encountered the spirit of God and for the the king of all kings it takes a whisper it takes a whisper. You don't have to be sidelined on the interstate, though he will allow us to hit rock bottom if you're extra prideful like me. And it takes a lot of work to get you to see. But the reality is that with the king of all kings, all it really takes for him is a whisper, is a name. Think how many times in the scripture he called someone by their name and everything changed. Mary Magdalene, she'd walked with Jesus. She knew Jesus' voice. She knew his face. She was a friend of Jesus. And yet she'd seen the trauma of the cross. And when she went to go to his tomb and saw that it was empty because her heart was overwhelmed thinking about the circumstances she had understood in the natural, she was not yet able to understand or comprehend what was occurring in the spiritual, that he had risen, that he had done what he said going to do. So the word of God says that Jesus spoke to her, so she heard his voice, but she didn't recognize it. And it says she turned and she saw him, so she saw this man that she'd had a friendship with. We're going to keep rolling. She saw this man who she'd walked with every day, but she didn't recognize him. She thought it was a gardener. It wasn't until Yeshua, the Messiah, until Jesus said, Mary, that her spiritual eyes were open. And she said, Rabbani, she was able to comprehend the resurrected Christ. See, a lot of us know a lot about Jesus, or we've heard a lot about the Bible, or we could maybe tell you a lot about God. But what changes things in our lives is when we humble ourselves like children to say, I'm at the end of my rope. I need to get real for a moment and stop hiding behind these masks. I want to come to you. I, I, I need you. I'm overwhelmed by all that is going on. It is in those moments that we have made ourselves like little children, the word of God says, that we have humbled ourselves before the Lord and he is faithful to lift us up. It's in those moments that we come out of a lot of head knowledge about Jesus and we encounter the resurrected Christ. Whoa, you rose. Oh, you have the power. Oh, you took the keys. Oh, you have defeated the works of the enemy. Oh, your blood is sufficient to break every generational curse, to break through every sin that has bound me, to heal me, to resurrect me. Oh, this is a different degree of power I'm encountering now. And that's what an encounter with Jesus shifts in us. 
when he says our name. There was something that happened in that Jeep that I still can't put full words around. But in that moment, the reality of the cross became personal to me because I was the rebel. I was the hypocrite. I was the self-harming girl. I was the promiscuous one. I was the woman at the well. I was the prostitute uh, or the adulteress to be stoned. I was red-handed in my sin and my inequity. Things that had happened to me that were out of my control and things that had happened as a result of sin I chose. I was in the middle of all of it, in a pit of mire, like the Word of God says, just muck. And he wrote a new identity over me in that vehicle. He said, I call you redeemed. And we need to realize the full meaning of that word. Because a lot of the times we hear a half gospel, like it starts midway through the story of you are a sinner in need of a savior. Yes, that's true. But it wasn't where things began. See, when Christ redeems us, It is a deeming back to our right standing. That means we were once, just like Adam and Eve, in right standing with the king of all kings, in perfect intimacy with him, walked with him, knew him. This is what we see in the garden, that Adam and Eve were one with God, communed with him, able to carry the mandate over their lives. They were the image-bearing creations of God. So the Spirit of God said, I am going to manifest myself in physical form between man and woman, together a complete picture of my heart, of my character, able to carry out the assignments I have for their lives, to reign and rule over what I have given them, to see the kingdom carried out righteously and in peace. But then the enemy entered in, sin deceived us, and what did we choose? Oh, I'm going to choose for myself what's best for me or what I want. Sin entered in. And we've all come down from the likeness of Adam. And we're being invited into the likeness of Christ, who's come to redeem us. See, think about it this way if we think about the imagery and the beauty of God's design of sex and its right nature. We knew perfect intimacy with God in the garden. And the enemy deceived mankind and invited us out. Don't you want to be single? Don't you want to choose for yourself? This is the lure we get, right? Make your own choices. It's all relative. Live your life. Live your truth. And we think we're taking this as this life of autonomy. But in reality, the enemy lured mankind out of the intimacy with God and then trafficked us into a brothel. We become enslaved by sin. We're used and abused by the unclean. The enemy has his way and we are like a mess in the mix of this. But the work of the gospel of Christ, remember how marriage is talked about in Genesis? Well, it's prophesying the gospel, that a man would leave his father's house and take his wife, that the two would become one flesh, and that they would be naked and unashamed. Well, guess who left his father's house to come to receive of his bride, Christ? Christ left the heavens to come and receive of the church, the bride, That in a covenant made with him, we become one flesh. And as he works out our salvation through us, we are then able to be naked and unashamed spiritually before God again. No sin, no fig leaves we're hiding behind. No sin that hasn't allowed the light to bring it out. We're redeemed into our true identity. Because the work of the cross was Jesus coming down to that brothel. Coming down and taking the cross, defeating death, 
taking the keys and busting down the prison doors that we've been captured behind, reaching in to draw us out of darkness, out of addiction, out of anxiety, out of depression, out of compulsion, out of self-harm, out of a victim mentality, out of everything that the enemy has used over our lives to steal, kill, and destroy the destiny that God had for us as his creations for such a time as this here on earth. He comes to draw us out. And what I love about it is that he doesn't take the time to say, all right, baby girl, go clean yourself up. Then come find me. No, he draws us out of the brothel and with all of our scars, with all of our mess, with all of our PTSD from the sin that has so entangled our lives, he takes a knee and proposes a marriage covenant to us. You are mine and I am yours. I shed my blood that a covenant would be made between you and I. I'm not going anywhere. I won't leave you or forsake you. I've laid down my life for you. Will you choose me? We say yes to that. Oh, the goodness and the glory that comes. I love the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. And I think it's important we understand when we read the scriptures, women don't gloss over the stories about men. Men don't gloss over the stories about women. A woman in the word prophesies the church. So if a woman is in the text in this way, the woman at Samaria, it is speaking to all of us as his bride. And what's beautiful about this story and what in that car, in that moment, and in the days that followed after I said yes to that marriage covenant, even though I felt very unworthy, yet I was overwhelmed with the love of God, is that he began to bring this story to my mind and minister to my spirit. You see, Jesus was actually there waiting at the well. Remember how I told you he's the one who pursues, he's the one who came down, he's the one who saw you as you were knit together in your mother's womb. He's the one that knows the plans and purposes of your days. He's the one who knows how he intends to, to use you for your good and for his glory in such a time as this. He's creator. The enemy is only imitator. So he speaks your identity as a man of God, as a woman of God. The enemy only imitates every other identity he thinks she'll take the bait of. But in this moment, he's at the well, and it's high noon. It's the sixth hour, as the word says. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have been to the Middle East, but you're not trying to go draw water at high noon. It's hot. It's not the time people would have been out and gathered. And yet the Samaritan woman is coming to draw water at that time because she didn't want to be seen. She didn't want to be known. As I told you my story, remember all of these things I was able to just keep in the hidden, keep in the darkness. I didn't want to be known. She's coming out to draw water at this time, and Jesus is there waiting for her. And here's what I really love is he breaks past everything that's taboo. He says to her, will you give me a drink? And this woman's like, pardon? Because she's a Samaritan woman. He's a Jewish man. Culturally at that time, that was not a, a, an interaction to be had. She literally says, like, why are you speaking to me? How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that you're saying this to, give me a drink, or who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And this is what I love about the Samaritan woman, because I just relate, but I think all of us do. Um, she's like a logistics kind of lady, it seems. And she says to him, <clears throat> I'm sorry, sir, but you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is really deep, and you don't even have a bucket. And how many times, as funny as it is, but I knew this from what I was wrestling with in my heart with God, how many times do we become our best talker-outers of the grace of God? No, you don't know my circumstances, and you don't know why I have to go back to that, and you don't know the pull that that has on me, and you don't really know who you're calling out here, and the man that I have been, or the woman that I have been, and you don't understand the home dynamics that I've been in, and you don't understand why I stay in that relationship, even though it's toxic and abusive, and you really don't want me rebuke the lies of the enemy he knows exactly who he chooses who he encounters who he died for and that is you it's very intimate and personal 
they go on to have this exchange. And he basically says, you know, everyone who drinks of this water will again become thirsty. But if you drink of living water, it will create a well, a spring up in you that never runs dry. And this is what I picture of that woman because I knew it from my own life. There are wells that we are going to that it has become a habitual practice and process for us. We've got to go back to the world and I can do this and I'm strong enough and I'll figure it out and I'll get my finances in order and I won't shoot up again and I, I won't, I'll get rid of my computer maybe and I, I won't turn to that stuff again or I'll just get like a simpler phone and, and then we fall and we fail because we're trying to do things in our own strength and we head back to the well for another drink. Okay, maybe if I could just um, figure it out or, or, or do better, and then it's back to the world, and we fall, and we fail, and we're back to this place, and in our own strength, we're depending on a well to satisfy us that will only leave us thirsty. It's the next fix. It's the next high. It's the next woman. It's the next guy. Everything we go and think will be what satisfies us. What a trail we, we just... Um, <laughs> bear in the land walking back and forth back and forth and he says you know this is only going to leave you still thirsty and I'm going to be honest we're in a thirsty generation he says I have a different water for you you'll never be thirsty again and it's really interesting because then at that point she's like well I'll take that water and how often are we like well I'll take that grace Jesus okay I want that I want that but he doesn't give it to her immediately what he first does is he addresses the very thing that has the strongest hold on her. He says, okay, first go and get your husband. She's like, I don't, I don't have a husband. He says, I know. You've had five. And the man you're living with now, you're not even married to. In this moment with the offer of his living water, he doesn't leave her to figure out what this addresses in her life what it will satisfy. He ministers to the deepest wound within her first because that's what the living water is intended to be poured out over, to bring desert into fertile land, to transform, to hydrate, to replenish and renew. He touches the part of her that had her even coming out to the well at high noon. Shame that was her bannered identity. He says, let's handle this. And she has this exchange with him, and she says, I presume you to be a prophet. I perceive that you're a prophet. And he goes on to say, listen, believe me, the hour is coming where neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, it is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And she says, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who they call Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And here's what blows my mind. For the first time in the whole of the scriptures to that point, Jesus reveals the full nature of his identity to the shame covered woman at the well, to the addict who is run out of options and come to him humbly, to the person who is compulsive and consumed by self-harm and crying out for rescue, to anyone and everyone who would call upon the name of the Lord, who has not been seen, who is hiding, who is overwhelmed. It was the Samaritan woman, it's the first person in the scriptures that he reveals the fullness of his identity to. He says, I who speak to you am he. He is saying, I am the Messiah. I am the one who's come to save. I am the one who is leading you in the truth. And what I love about her too is she's not like, no, that, that's not me that you're talking about. Um, suddenly I've encountered something bigger than I even realized. And let me try to act perfect or pretty on the outside. No, um, it, it's a different lady with the husbands. Or no, I can't handle this. No, this is too much for me to process. Instead, rather than running from that encounter, it says that she drops her buckets and she does run, but it's back to town with a new man's name on her lips. Now, mind you, this is the woman who's always had a different guy. But this time she returns to town 
proclaiming the name above all names. And it says many came to believe. In fact, they asked Jesus to come to their town and many more came to believe. The woman at the well was the first evangelist in the scriptures. That means Jesus released the evangelistic arm of his ministry to the the shame cloaked, broken, fractured, one thing to the next, to the next, to the next woman. The very first person he released evangelistic assignment to was the woman at the well. And that's you and me, if your story is anything like mine. That's the one who encounters him and isn't all puffed up and pretty and thinking, well, maybe I just need Jesus so that I can um, prosper monetarily. Maybe I just need Jesus so that I can have this title and fit in with society around me. No, he says, I'm looking for the ones who want to worship me in spirit and in truth, who want to know who they are in the natural and who want to come alive to who I've made them to be in the spirit. I want the ones who say no more of any of this that is binding me. I will repent. I will renounce. I will humble myself before the Lord and let go of all the things I've run to or thought would satisfy me. He says, I'm looking for those and the time is now. And he releases the first evangelist, a ragtag rebel who needed his mercy and who encountered his grace. And it changed everything. It changed everything. This is what Jesus did in my life, and this is the Jesus I serve. He's not soft. He's not weak. He's not formed in my own making. He's loving and he's patient and he's kind. He's long-suffering. He's good. He's gracious. And he came like the lamb. But he roars out of us like the lion. Because when he came, he did the work that broke the curse to set the captives free. And when we will humble ourselves to him, And say, I need you. I need you. He gives the gift of his Holy Spirit to us that lights a flame, that produces living water that can't be snuffed out and it can't run dry. It is so good. It is so good to encounter the love of God. It is so good to day in and day out continue to humble ourselves before God. It is so good to live the way that's hard because what's hard is holy. I was talking to my friend the other day who was overwhelmed with some anxiety. She'd come into revelation of something, a sin in her life that she needed to repent of. What a beautiful offering (laughs) that the Lord gives us. Hey, turn back. Turn back to the truth. And we've made repentance such a taboo word. No, it's the gift of God that we have the freedom and the joy now to throw off what so easily entangles and to turn back into his loving arms. But she was overwhelmed because she was encountering a sin that she was dealing with. And she said, I'm just feeling anxiety and I, I, I'm wrestling with it. And God gave me this picture of Peter Pan, as silly as that sounds. But I think a lot of times we don't really want to grow up. We don't really want to do the work that allows us to mature in the faith. We don't really want to put in the hours and the time and the vulnerability and the conversation and the prayer and the repentance and the worship. That's a lot, and we live in a world that demands a lot from us that looks very different from that, and so we don't really want to do the work. But Peter Pan went to Neverland, and the group he led were the lost boys. We as the people of God can't resist maturing in the faith or else we'll just be the blind leading the blind, the ones who suckle for milk and never hunger for the meat, the ones who are content with what life is and I guess this is the best for me and I'll never break out of this. No, I want to be the one who experiences that and then like Wendy and the two little brothers, I can't remember their name. I'm a mom of four kids, five and under and so it's just a lot of stories all the time. But there's two brothers also. I want to be the one who realizes this is great but this isn't it. 
I have to go. I have to go home to my true father's house. And I have to grow in wisdom and in stature, in strength and in glory. Because this world is lost and hurting and broken. And the same chains that the enemy tried to bind your life up with will be the ones that God so graciously untangles you from and uses to bind up the serpent who has tried to steal, kill, and destroy the assignment for your days. Your struggles, what you've dealt with, will become the platform of your ministry as you minister to those who are a few steps behind, who have been broken, who have been consumed. We come with the good news of the gospel to say, I know the one who sets people free. I know the one who delivered me of a pornography addiction in a moment. I know the one who there's been other things in my life that it's taken more of a process. It's taken more of time, but he's worked these things out in me. Hey, I I know the one that has the answer. We have a world looking and crying out for anyone to put their hope in. I want the church to rise up into our true identities. So we're the ones like the Samaritan woman who go and tell. To invite people to come and see. That's what the word says. Our lives are meant to be a living testimony. You're not meant to stay captive and enslaved to things that the enemy intends to use to crush you. You're meant to know freedom, and it's found in Jesus. And the blood of Jesus is sufficient. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the power of your blood. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who leads us in the way that we should go, God. We thank you that the invitation is so simple to humble ourselves before you and admit we need you. And God, in that, you save us, you rescue us, and you gift us with your spirit that teaches us, that comforts us, that counsels us, that convicts us. Thank you for your body that surrounds us in our brothers and sisters to be our accountability, to be our conversation, to be all that you are manifested in the flesh for us, to be our friends, to be our partners in walking things forward. We can't do any of this alone. We can't do any of this apart from you, and we need the body to really see things move through to full health. So God, we thank you that this is what you've given us. You do not withhold any good thing from those who cry out for more of you, God. So I pray tonight as your anointing flows, that it would break the yoke. I pray in the name of Jesus that addictions would fall and bow at his throne. I pray that compulsion would bend a knee and bow to the name of Jesus. I pray that anxiety would bend a knee and bow to the name of Jesus, that depression would do the same and bow to the name of Jesus. I pray that every generational curse that is permeated family lines, that the blood of Jesus would cover and break them in his mighty and matchless name. I pray that captives would be set free. I pray that those walking with you, their inner spirit would be strengthened, that in the moments of temptation, in the moments of testing or trial, you would minister to their inner spirit and remind them of their true identity. You are a shame breaker. You are a life changer. You are a miracle worker. No one can tell us that you can't do it because we've tasted and seen. We've looked upon your glory working in and through each and every person's life. So God, I pray an anointing over this group that they would rise up into a level of glory that is new, that is sweet, that is powerful in their lives and that they would do the very same thing that the, the Samaritan woman did, that they wouldn't deny or hide or, or try to, to move outside of the goodness and glory of what you have, but they would be the ones to go and proclaim, come and see, look what he's done in my life. Look what he's doing in my family's life. Look what he's doing in my community, that they would come and see that they would go and tell that we would be the proclaimers of the good news right where we are today. Because every life touched by you testifies to a degree of your glory. So let us be empowered and emboldened as the image-bearing creations of God made to reflect your glory today. Once bound and enslaved by sin but set free by your mercy, by your grace, by your work, it is finished. We receive our inheritance in you today, God. 
We are free and free indeed. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Give us hearts like yours and keep transforming our lives. Keep transforming us into your likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much. Hydration? <laughs> Needed. Okay. So this is going to be the halftime portion of what we're doing tonight. We're going to take the next 30 minutes or so, and Mo has agreed to ask, answer any questions that we may have. So that's what we're going to do now after I give her another microphone. Man, this thing is tangled. We are going to do the serenity prayer, and then we'll jump off. You go try that one again. Test, test, one, two, three. Try it again. Go. Cool. Sweet. I'll put that one back. Okay, so while we're standing, if you're not standing, go ahead and stand. There's a couple of you. We'll go ahead and say the serenity prayer, and then we'll answer any questions. Well, I'm not going to answer anything. If you've got any questions for Mo, uh, now's the time to ask. So Phil's going to be on one side of the room. I'll be on the other. Raise your hand. We'll bring you the microphone. And then any questions you guys, you guys may have, we'll go from there. So if you guys would, say the serenity prayer with me. God. God. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Amen. Remember, come back next week. Go through 101. Come check out Celebrate Recovery, what we normally do. So you guys don't have to leave, but this is what we're getting ready to do with the question and answer session. You ready? I'm ready. All right. I hope. So let's start with this one. What advice would you give? Everybody can sit back down. What advice would you give to a young man or young lady who is stuck in a sin-repent cycle that they cannot seem to break, what advice would you give? Oh, that's a great question. That is a great question. I know um, for a while for myself, I so cycled in that and earnestly wanted to be free of the sin, right? It's what draws us to repentance. But then in a moment uh, would encounter the temptation again or would be triggered or would find myself in a setting or a situation that was just not conducive for my thriving or for my health in uh, resisting this and so would fall back into the sin again. And then I read the scripture that talked about um, just how grievous this cycle really is to the heart of the father that it is like a dog returning to its vomit. It's like better to have not known the truth than to know it and still go back to the sin. And I just, it resonated so much with me because I'm like, that's what it feels like, God. And I know this isn't what you have. Um, and so I need help. I need to know how I'm supposed to walk this out. And the, the clearest thing that I recognized in that time was first and foremost that I needed to daily, hourly profess my need and my dependence on him to stay aware of just how much I needed the Holy Spirit to be with me. And I think a lot of the times we stumble and struggle when we get distracted or we get busy or our calendars get crazy full or we're just kind of mindlessly giving in to old habits or um, whatever it may be. And so being intentional about finding our way into the presence of God to connect with him, to intimately commune with him and say, I need you today. I'm going to need you just as much tomorrow, but tomorrow has enough worries of its own. I'm focused on today. Your grace is sufficient. I need you with me. That became a very practical, applicable thing, um, as well as being really intentional with my surroundings and the environments that I placed myself in. Almost every time that I fell back into sin, it was because something uh, in my setting or in my decisions of who I was around or what I was doing, it was like triggering to me, right? Um, 
And so if you're struggling in sexual sin, laying down to cuddle with your boyfriend and watch a movie, not always your best decision, not always your best choice, because you're in a setting in which there's not really accountability and in which resisting and saying no just becomes so hard. And so starting to surround yourself with accountability, but also being um, aware and intentional in the environments that you put yourself in, in the music that you're listening to, in the things that you're watching, all of these different access points really uh, shape our mind. And so I, uh, especially when I came to know Jesus, man, I remember the, the prayer of my heart was, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours and bind my heart to thee. Give me eyes to see the world as you see it. Give me ears to hear the cry of the hurting. Lord, make me more like Jesus. Make me more like you. And when I began to pray that, it was like my eyes started to get really sensitive to what I was seeing. <laughs> Suddenly, the same TV shows didn't do it for me anymore. Suddenly, the same music, like, I was actually listening to the words, and I was like, what am I singing? This is a lot. Why am I saying these things? Like, suddenly, he really began to transform me, and when I got that uh, triggered to go look at porn again a, a month or so after giving my heart to the Lord and being on that high, right, like we're on that mountaintop, um, but then was just finding myself in a more stagnant place. I remember opening the computer after having prayed that prayer so often. For the moment where the circumstances and the surrounding wasn't healthy for me, I opened that computer, but suddenly the Holy Spirit, it was like my prayer for new eyes he had answered. Suddenly my heart was just broken for what I was seeing, and I was overwhelmed. I remember slamming the computer shut and just asking, like weeping, weeping, no longer seeing these people as body parts made for my pleasure, but image-bearing creations of God, humanized. And so I think those consistent prayers not only welcomes the Lord to, um, not only puts our need for him on our radar, but it also welcomes him to move in advance for us because we've made our heart open and willing to that. And at the same time, making sure that we're not finding ourselves in situations or setting that we just know aren't great for us um, really eliminated a lot of those backsliding moments for me as well because, man, it was tough. I couldn't go out to the bar. I, when I went back to LSU after that car accident, I want, those were my people, the people who I'd been sinning with <laughs> and sleeping with and, you know, out getting drunk with. That was my friend group, right? But the Spirit of God, even in my young, young, young walk of faith, was reminding me that setting's not going to be good for you right now. And, and we got all our reasons, right? I was like, well, somebody's got to share the gospel in the bars. And so let it be me, Lord. I'm on fire for you. And then sure enough, I get there, and the next thing I know, I'm hammered, and I'm waking up with a different individual. And what was different in that moment after receiving Christ wasn't condemnation that came, but it was conviction. And it was conviction that said, you know the better way. You've encountered me. You know this isn't it. And God's so kind in leading us that way. And that encouraged me the next time to say no to that invitation. I can't. I can't roll with y'all. I can't be out there. It is, not, it is not for my good. And you'll be amazed at the number of people you realize were just acquaintances that enjoyed that you served the sin in them rather than true friends. Um, but God is so faithful to restore those things. So everything that we say no to that's not of him, he's going to be really faithful to bless and multiply the goodness of what is of him. But we have to take those intentional steps of welcoming him in, of being conscious and intentional about where we're placing ourselves and just yielding our life to him. That'll help us move through those cycles, you know, those constant cycles. Things have to change, and sometimes it's you that has to choose to change them. That's really good. Has anybody else got any questions? She went through a whole lot tonight, man. That was awesome. I know. I went 18 minutes over just on my talk, so <laughs> y'all are like, we got to go. I get it. No, nope, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Do you ever talk to younger, is there an age group that you usually talk to? Or? Let's see, my youngest is five months, and I work to share the gospel with him already. <laughs> um, uh, the reason why I'm asking, um, yeah. I go to Discovery Church in Bristol, and the youth pastor is very, very good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's, I mean, he, he tries to be up to date mm -hmm. with the things that's going on. And, like, every year, it's called Sextober. 
because mm. he wants them to understand God's will. Yeah. And, you know, he wants them to know that they should stay pure. And so, you know, he look, goes into it deeply. Yeah. And I just think what you have to say would benefit and you're more their age. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I feel like you could, you know, they could benefit from hearing, hearing yeah. you speak. Yeah, praise God. I, I have spoken and shared with all different ages and demographics. Um, I think what's beautiful is that for every one of us, as we carry the good news forward, the word of God doesn't return void. And oftentimes I think we discount people by their age or sex or whatever it may be. Um, or we, we believe the enemy's deception that we're disqualified to, you know, minister into that space. But if we're testifying to the goodness and glory of God, I've seen young children place their faith in him. I've seen great grandmothers reach out about being impacted by it. It's all across the board. And let that be encouragement and reminders to you all too. Um, The gospel is not like for a niche market. The gospel is for all who have ears to hear. The, The least and the lost. Our young people are overwhelmed right now by so many things, it breaks my heart. And so I'm more than willing to speak to the youth, but I would encourage each of you too to find your way. Ask God, where is it? Send me. Send me to share your good news. Um, And the places he'll send us are are important and are diverse. And he's just looking for a faithful heart that'll say, yes, I'll go. Remember in the scripture, he's like, send me, I'll go. Um, And that it, it reaches far and wide, the gospel. So I do speak to groups that are younger like that, Um, but let's pick up that mandate too in our own community to be pouring into the young hearts, um, families. So many kids are going through so much. Lord, you hit a wrong hashtag on Twitter and you're in porn, porn on your phone. Like the average age of exposure to pornography, I think is nine years old. Uh, That's the average. So that's a lot. Uh, In 2016, I believe it was, in one calendar year, on one pornographic website, uh, we as a people consumed 4.6 billion hours of porn. That's 17,000 complete lifetimes in one year on one website. So if we think that's just an issue affecting unsaved males, we're very naive. It's affecting men, women, Christians, non-Christians, children. It's vicious. And we need to be the voices that are reaching out to the young people. and. Um, pouring into them, mentoring them, sharing the truth with them, because people really at the heart are just looking for connection, just want to be known and loved and seen, and those counterfeit ways are not for our good, are for God's glory. So who said, you be the change you want to see in the world? Who said that? Somebody? Maya Angelou? Someone. I don't know. But you be the change you want to see in your community. Uh, It's so important. This isn't really a question, but I just wanted to speak to something that I think you're so powerfully and courageously doing, is you're standing in a place of really breaking a false narrative. Like you said, porn is only a man's issue. Um, Or conversely, what we'll see in the church is abortion is only a women's issue. Mm. Um, So I just want to applaud you and thank you so much for so courageously letting him use your worst chapters for Mm. such great victories in Christ and really standing in a place against that false narrative. It matters so much. Yeah. Especially, like you said, with our kids and the technology. So, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Did anyone else have any questions? Mo's going to be hanging around for a little bit anyway. Yeah. After we're over. Hi. Hi. Um, since, uh, well, tomorrow night we finish our um, 12-step program through Celebrate Recovery at our church. Praise God. And um, God's really been convicting me a lot lately, just um, through your courage to share your story. And he's been convicting me a lot to share mine. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know, what was your defining moment that gave you the courage to just let all your walls down and let everybody just see you? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, A defining moment. You know in the scriptures when Peter um, is with Jesus and Jesus is like, 
before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, never, Lord, I would not. And yet then he confronts the three different people, and he just crumples. And he crumples in front of a slave girl who really would have had no influence in society, no real power or might to destroy Peter. But a slave girl even asks him, don't you know that Jesus? And he's like, no. Fast forward a few chapters. He's standing toe to toe with the Pharisees and with the people of society that had great influence and could have easily canceled him and crucified him just like they had just crucified Jesus. And he's standing toe to toe with them and will not back down sharing the good news of the gospel. What occurs in that gap between the denial under very limited pressure to standing firm under a lot of pressure was the filling of the Holy Spirit. When I was filled with the Spirit of God, and that too we receive by faith, right? We receive Jesus by faith, but many don't realize too, we, we have to open ourselves to receive the filling of the Holy Spirit by faith as well. It's the, it's the gift available for all of us. But when I received the Spirit of God and just said, Lord, whatever you want with my life, I am a vessel for you. My shame is of no concern. My, the way this whole campus could laugh at me and drag me, like it's not of concern to me. I am open to you using me as your vessel. When I received that boldness of the Spirit, that was a really shifting moment for me where suddenly I realized there was a new courage in me that I couldn't even muster on my own. It was literally by faith. I was believing, man, if I go forward and say this or share this, I'm going to believe that God's my protector and he's my provider. And all the worst case scenarios my mind is thinking through right now, I believe he's got them covered. And that's been my same mentality from the first time I shared my testimony to every time forward where I've shared a new piece of myself publicly. Like when I wrote my book, Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot, there were things I was writing in there, like even an, adult, an adulterous encounter that I was involved in in college. I was too drunk to even realize the man was married. I had never told anyone <laughs> except my husband and one friend. And I'm like, well, I guess 70,000 people are reading this now. Like, but because I had brought those broken, hard parts of myself to the Lord, because he had first ministered to them in the quiet, hidden place, because he had filled me with the boldness of his spirit, I was able to go forward in courage, knowing I wasn't speaking from a place of fragility, kind of like Peter was in front of the slave girl. I was speaking from a place of faith because I'd experienced his hand healing it, right? And so then we don't just become like word vomiting our woes on everyone, we're able to testify to the woes and point to the one who transformed us, right? When our story centers around him versus just our own stuff, there is a grace and an empowering of the spirit that will come. And it's just so amazing. You'll realize the first time you do it, you will have thought everyone would reject you or laugh you down or slander you or whatever. More people than I can even count will come up saying, I had no idea we could even talk about that. Me too. Or I've dealt with that too. And when you start to see, we so often count the, count the cost and it paralyzes us. We got to shift our focus to the gain. If Christ is compelling us to, to speak life and to testify, we got to think about the people that it's going to reach and impact. And that makes our lives nothing to us. And it makes his his kingdom moving forward, everything that we live for. And so that would probably be the changing point is when I really opened my heart and said, God, whatever you want to do or use with my life, it's yours. And that Holy Spirit power, just I'd stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone now and talk them down because I've, I've experienced it. You can't talk me out of what I've experienced. That's why testimony becomes so powerful. So I would encourage you and, and pray even a grace over you as you let him minister to those places and embolden you forward to share. It's your portion as his daughter. There's one right over here. 
something you touched on during your testimony, um, whether you're a new Christian or been a Christian for a long time, and you constantly have that feeling of, well, Lord, you don't know what I've done, or, or you don't want me to serve here because you don't know my past. Yeah. But I think you went on to say that that's exactly why he does want you. Can you elaborate on that some more for those of us here that may be struggling with that? Sure. Yeah. This is what really shook me when I realized the root of so much of that resistance in my own life is that it ultimately roots down to pride, pride in ourselves, Um, to think of ourselves and our perception of ourselves and our understanding of the greater picture, to think that we can even comprehend all of that and that we carry the power to determine if uh, that'll be effective or not. And when I saw that it was pride really at the heart sort of continuing, it's what the father of lies, it's what the enemy wants us to believe, right? You're disqualified. You're not there yet. We're all in the process of preparation. We're all in the process of sanctification. But nothing in the word, nothing that I've found in the word shows Jesus encountering someone and then saying, Um, but don't you dare move a muscle or speak a word or do anything until, uh, until everything's perfect. Mary Magdalene encounters him right there and he's like, go and tell. The woman at the well, she goes and she testifies. Person after person, the, the leper that he heals, the ones that he meets and he frees, the adulterous woman who was stoned, he says, now go and sin no more. He always gives instruction. He always gives the movement in which we are to move forward in, whether that is in processes of deeper healing in a program that can help lead us through things, whether that is sharing with a person in our lives or our family or a community, whether that is moving into uh, a mission field. His assignment over each one of us is perfectly intended for exactly who you are. And his grace is sufficient. To, to carry out the work that he intends, as long as we continue to stay in a place of saying, remove all pride for your glory, as long as we stay at a place intimately communing with him, listening, obeying, oh, he wants to use us in such beautiful ways. And I think use us can be a, fr- a sensitive term sometimes, because many of us have been used and abused by people right? They want what we can create or produce. They don't really see us. So let me um, reword that by saying he wants us to partner with him. The word of God says to co-labor with Christ. He loves you. And, And there are so many people that are awaiting your yes to God, and they don't even know, and you don't even know. And if we give a yes to Jesus, But then we just start going, 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 but we disconnect from the vine, right? Like we're not actually still being intimate with God. We're not actually feasting on his word. We're not letting him continue to do the heart work. That's where we get into trouble territory of um, maybe moving in unhealth and hurting more than we're helping, right? But if we give him our yes and we realize my yes is feeble if I'm not fully connected with you, that's when uh, he's able to work through us and use us as his vessel and we co-labor with him. So I would say that if you find yourself in the place of wanting to be used by him, but all of the disqualifying thoughts, the answer is to, to commune with him, to draw near to him and he will draw near to you to find your way into the word so that you can take those thoughts captive. You can commit them to Christ. You can know the truth to continue to explore him. When we are connected with him, that work that he's carrying out is going to be organic, spirit-led, and beautiful. And when those thoughts come of you're not good enough for this, we'll say, no, 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 Let let me tell you. Let me tell you who I truly am. But if we're out of step with him trying to just go and do, 
to fill our calendar, our schedule, and those thoughts come, we're going to have a hard time combating them, right? So the answer is always to come back to the Word of God, to come back to the presence of God, to be communing with Him. And that way, He uses every person at every step for His greater story. Does that help answer that a little bit? Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, we got about time for about one more question. Real quickly, if you would, at what point in your story, uh, if you could share with us where the uh, Fifty Shades of Grace originated yeah. Yeah. and what prompted you, if it, what part of your story that prompted you to write that? That's a great question. So this is exactly what I mean, sort of to piggyback off of that question you just asked to tie into yours. When I first came to know Jesus, I felt an overwhelming stir to write my story out. You know, when the Lord's leading you in something, it's very different when you feel like you're having to search and figure out what God wants you to do. Oftentimes that's because we're a little disconnected from him versus when you're just hungry for him, he'll start bringing things that you can't shake and you can't forget. And he was just compelling me. He said, looking back, I'm like, wow, he had to really talk to me like a kid then, but I get it. He was like, I want you to tell everyone everything. And somehow I knew and discerned that didn't mean just, again, word vomiting all of my junk, but he wanted me to testify. And he was saying, write it. And so, y'all, I started the most rudimentary blog. I don't know anything about technology. I'm still figuring it out. I just bought a WordPress And I started this blog, and I thought, you know what? A lot of people at home still have questions about my dad's suicide, just friends and family that never got a lot of the details. Um, I'm sure people have questions about the car accident. I'm walking around in a neck brace. You know, I'm just going to share my story, and I'll put it on Facebook, and so my friends and family can read. And I began to just write this, just faithfully, because he said, tell everyone everything. Just write, 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 write. In 19 days, I posted like 19 parts to my story. And at the end of it, it had like 250,000 views because someone had read it and shared it. And that person shared it, shared it, shared it. Things were, there was never this thought of like, I need to create this thing and everyone see it and love it. I just knew God was saying, tell your story and write it. And then he used it. So then I realized, I guess I should blog. I guess this is, <laughs> this is an avenue right now that I should do. And um, I was the world's worst blogger. I still am because it'd be like 19 blogs in a row. Then you wouldn't hear from me for four months. And then <laughs> I'd write something. I never wanted to just write trying to dig stuff up myself. It was when God said, write that now, like a moment. And so it was maybe a year or so in when I just one day started getting this poem in my mind, Fifty Shades of Grey, had come out. And all of these Christians were going to see it and talking about it. And it it didn't compute in my mind. (laughs) I, I couldn't understand, like, the hypocrisy, for lack of a better word, because I knew in my spirit that's the last place I would go or watch. And so I thought, you know, for the glory of God, If everyone is so fascinated by Fifty Shades of Grey right now, I'm about to use that and turn it for his glory. And I just started getting these lines of poetry in my mind, and I just wrote them, Fifty Shades of Grace, and I shared it with no motive other than let's bring this back for his glory and talk about the very flip of what the movie was, right? And then, like, Priscilla Schreier somehow saw that and invited me onto her talk show And that was the first time I'd ever talked about my sexual testimony. I had done it in that poem. And then suddenly God was like, and now here. And so that's how that one came about. And we recorded it um, when I released my second book to be like a part, a companion to the book, basically on the website. We like recorded it more formally. But almost all of the things that God has ultimately used for his glory in my life have not been with a pre-thought plan of here's my marketing scheme or here's my business model. It's always been with like, I'm just in the presence of God, letting him work stuff out in here. And I just obey when he says to do something and then he does what he intends with it. So that's how that poem came out. God is so creative. He'll use all of the unique gifts and talents in each of our lives 
that are so different from one another and so unique to the, to the DNA print that he knit together in you. He wants to use all of them for his glory, every single thing we have in us. Um, and so allowing, I, I think sometimes the body of Christ needs to be rejuvenated in that creativity spirit. Like, he is creator. We are in his image, so we are to create for his glory. And um, tapping into the fun ways that really excite your soul to do that, he just uses them. It beats me. It makes publishers scratch their head, and everyone who vies so hard for, like, to build a following, they're like, how did you do X, Y, or Z? And I'm like, I have no idea. I just, it just happened. I just did what he said, and it just happens. So I think all of us, the delight of coming back to creating just for the joy of glorifying him is really fruitful work for the kingdom. I think creativity is something. That. I love creativity, personally. Are I you love, creative? I love yeah. creativity. And, and it drives most of my leadership crazy mm -hmm. because I'll be like, this is a great idea. I've had like 13-foot inflatables inside here because I was like, yeah. that's a cool idea. Let's go with it. And they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I'm following what God what God's <laughs> calling me to do. So creative. Here's the thing. We need the creatives, and then we need the logistics people. Oh, They're very important to the body of Christ. There's Phil. Hey, <laughs> there's Phil. There's Phil. He carries out the logistics. This, this is the balance we have inside CR. Yeah. I'm the crazy one. Phil's the one's like, I think it's a stupid idea. <laughs> and he just calls it the way it is. So. Everybody give Mo a hand one more time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank she you. didn't bring a bunch of books to pop out to anybody. She came here to share the Word of God and to share her story. Mm -hmm. So you got a few minutes to talk, hang around for a little bit? Yeah, I'll be right out there. Uh -huh. Sweet. So uh, there's snacks outside. Do me a favor now. Look to your left, look to your right. If there's paper or pens in the seat beside of you, pick them up and put them in a white basket behind on the blue table as you go out the door. Thank you guys for being here, and I hopefully see you next Tuesday.